Okay. All right, just give me a moment to share my screen, but it's nice to see all your faces. I hope you're all well. All right. All right, so we are officially in class five territory of the course, which means we're halfway through this course, Death and the Realms of Existence. Um, and as always, you know, we'll do a little bit of a review, but, or here actually is what I was thinking. So we're halfway through. I think today we'll just dive into Bardo Realm content because there's a lot and I hope there are a lot of questions and some of the original recordings I heard, the whole class was just like questions and back and forth. Uh, so I hope it brings up a lot of questions in your mind and we can talk about that. And then starting Thursday, when we meet next, um, this is something we've done in the past. I think it's worked out well. We'll use some breakout rooms, you know, at the beginning of class and spend the first 15, 20 minutes in smaller groups reviewing, um, you know, the, the realms that we've studied so far, the beings in them, the types of minds they have, the causes that they would have to get there. Um, and so you can really try to put it into your own words. I don't know how much of you are like talk, how many of you are talking to, you know, your roommates or partners or families about these different types of beings that you're learning about. I, maybe you're not. I definitely am not. Uh, but sometimes putting it into words can really help clarify those places where you're like, am I, do I believe this? What's going on? How much, how much of my mind is understanding what this is pointing to? So, oh, I think that's actually what I wanted to start with. Um, okay, let me get these both up here. This is just, it. okay, so I often work on slides for these classes. For those of you joining, there's gonna be slides throughout and that'll help um, give context for like the homework questions and, and some of the content that we're gonna go through. But I'm often sitting at like, you know, my family center island working on these slides. And my sister's now gotten used to some of the imagery, but very often she'll come up to me and be like, do you really believe this stuff? You know, cause she'll see me making a slide, which is like, how does one become a hungry ghost? And like have an image of it. And you know, she's like, do you really believe this stuff? And I really love when she asks me that because it, it gives me, you know, one of those forced meditations, forced contemplations of do I, you know, am I, am I taking this stuff to be metaphorical or literal? There's lessons in each, and I think it's a spectrum, you know, Th depending on the day and the week, I might deal with it differently. But I do think the thing that I'm not able to shake is the truth that I, through my current Supriya eyes, Supriya mind, I'm really only looking at a Supriya slice of reality. And that's a, it's a beautiful reality, but it's incomplete. It's not the full picture. Um, and it's not so much that like I'm looking at one slice of a big pie, but rather, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, those of you who wear glasses know this feeling of like when you're wearing your glasses and you open the dishwasher to unload it and they fog up because of the hot air. That happened to me the other day. Uh, it's more like that. It's more that I'm seeing through these foggy lenses. And so I'm seeing something, but it's not, it, the, the clarity isn't there. Um, and maybe we'll get into this later in the class, but it's, it's not as much what I'm not seeing clearly, but rather something that I think is there and it's not actually there. And I'll leave it at that, but I just want to, I hope we can get to the idea of emptiness today and it being the lack of something or the negation of something, uh, which is why it's so hard to put our minds on. But anyways, my point here was, so she said that, and you know, she asked me that often, you know, do you actually believe this stuff? Um, but also she sent me this, I don't know if any of you have seen this poster that um, Cuomo made, uh, and he did like a whole press conference on it too. And she sent it to me because she's like, it looks like some of the charts in your, in your presentations, like you should include it in your presentation. And it's supposed to be a map of New York City's 
uh, or I think all of New York's journey from, uh, I think it's 111 days of COVID-19. And so it's kind of wacky. I mean, there's like, there's like boyfriend cliff over here. There's yeah. 111 days of hell. Um, projections and models and it, it's like this he has this whole story around this chart depicting what he's experienced to be the last few weeks um, in New York and so it just got me thinking about how we do we use charts or depictions like this just to put a model on reality like to get a grasp of it right um, and how often do we get caught in the model itself or the chart itself, right? The artistry of it, the level of detail, something like that, rather than the reality that it's actually pointing to, like the thing that it's depicting. Um, so it's hard to see in this wheel of life image, the one on the right side. We'll look at another one later in the course where it's clearer, but if you can tell, everything we're doing in this course has to do with the inside of the wheel of life, right? The six realms, uh, the, six the six realms of the desire realm, the bardo realm, which is this ring in the middle, which we're going to learn about today, um, the 12 links of dependent origination. All of this is within the clutches of the Lord of Death, or Yama, uh, this wheel that's turned by the power of karma, or the, the impulses in our minds that just run uninhibited, right? But let us not forget to look outside of this wheel of life. You see, it's hard to tell in this one, but you see a Buddha, um, an enlightened being, a being that's seen through that fogginess, that's seen something that we think is there, but is not actually there. Uh, and what he's doing is pointing at the moon, which represents uh, wisdom or emptiness. So you can see that there, I don't know if you can see his arm outstretched with his finger and pointing at the moon. And so my teacher often gives this reminder that, you know, are you getting lost and looking at the Buddha's finger or are you looking at the moon? You know, because there's a lot of fingers out there. There are a lot of people that will uh, claim that they are pointing in that right direction, right? And, and you, could get, you could get drawn into that pointing. But are you looking at the finger or are you, do you have your sight set on the moon? It's all just a map. You still have to do it. So I'll just share that. That was something that came up today. She texted this to me and really wanted me to bring it up in class. Mm, okay, so let's begin. We're going to do a mini meditation as always, but I thought we'd do something a little different for, to give us an introduction to the Bardo realm and what it feels like there. So for those of you who've been to the Three Jewels space, Get ready to go down memory lane. You'll see what I mean once we get into the meditation. It'll be short and sweet. And then right from there, we'll offer the mandala and then begin class. Sound good? Okay. So just get comfortable. And if you're, you know, you're eating or walking or something, that's fine. Just try to turn your attention inward. And regardless of what you're doing, begin to deepen the breath. Catch any forward moving sensations in your body, any sense of rushing or restlessness even laziness or lethargy. And then try to just sit within yourself, find a center point. Straighten the spine, notice how nice that feels. And let the breath move the body in and out through the nose, slow. Relax fingers and toes. 
Release the backs of the knees and deep within the jaw. And if you've visited the Three Jewels in New York City, our Bowery location, just transport your mind there now to that entrance door, street level. Perhaps a memory you have of entering this space or just imagine it now. And as you enter, you see other people, faces you know or unfamiliar, a bustling cafe, many delights for the senses, treats, teas, coffee, smiling faces, vibrant plant life, art on the walls. Feel your senses tingling. A full bookshelf meant to stimulate the mind. Pieces of clothing to adorn yourself, fragrance, incense, all these worldly delights. Just walking yourself, your mind through this area. Pause when you reach the mirrored wall. So imagine at the back of this space, there's a mirrored surface from floor to ceiling, left to right. You're forced to encounter your own image. eye to eye, mind to mind with yourself. And just pause here. Look into your own eyes. And then feel yourself pushing that door open Moving to the next space, a mini realm. And here you begin to shed your bags, and take off your shoes. Not just the physical items, you also feel worries melting away any items on your to-do list, stresses, things you've been carrying with you all day. Feeling an unburdening on the shoulders, slowing down. Bathrooms, carrying a different type of shedding. All belongings, phone, wallet, keys, left behind as you step barefoot into the next room. If you've entered that space before, just latch on to a memory maybe going there for a class or to teach. This space tucked away, very little to hang on to, nothing on the walls, nothing on the floor.
and you find the perfect meditation seat just waiting for you in the center of the room. And you take your posture there. And feel the light breeze on your skin. You can feel the effort and goodness of every single being who's come through that room before you. And really feel that it's just you and your awareness, you and your mind. Ask yourself, where does your mind go? Unprompted. Where do you seek answers? Where do you seek guidance? sitting with the wisdom that's bubbled up in your own mind, all your insights, all your realizations, your aha moments. All the results of those analytical meditations, those debates. And as we open the mandala, chant the words, hold the gesture. Imagine that from sitting right there in the center of your three jewels, these realizations, the ultimate form of wisdom and compassion that exist within your own mind right now. Unspool from the center of you and begin to reach out, touching the beings on the street in the apartments around the building, going beyond geographical borders going beyond the limits of time and space. Create this perfect world as an offering. Sashi Hoki Jukshin Tok Tram Rab Ling Shin and Padi Sange shing do mik te war ki Jo kun nam dak shing la ju par shok Nidam guru rat namandala kam niryataya Sange shudam soki chok nam la Rang chu bardu dakni kapsu chi daki chengyan gi pe sanam ki drola penchir sange ju par sange chunam sogi chogam la chang chu bardu dakni kapsu chi Daki chenyan gi pe sanam ki Jola penchir sange ju par Sange jiram sogi choktam la Jang chu bardu dakni kapsu chi Daki chenyan gi pe sanam ki 
Jola Panchir Sangi Jupar Guide yourself out of the meditation as gently as you need. Okay, um, I hope that was fun for those of you who've been to the Three Jewels and maybe let you in on a little secret of how that space is designed. Um, I know many of you have actually been there yourself painting walls and sanding things or touching up the gold dust in the cafe floor cracks. Um, so maybe it felt a little emotional, but every, every part of that space is, we've thought about it. Uh, and it actually is meant to be a journey through, yeah, like the, a journey through the wheel of life, just the experience of entering the three jewels and wherever you get to. So it's, it's ripe with metaphor. Uh, for those of you who haven't visited us uh, in person or haven't been able to, I hope that gave you a little taste of it. But it's very, yeah, it's very purposely designed. Our cafe is samsara. It's a lot of shiny stuff. It's, stu it, it, it's connections with others. It's, it's not that that stuff isn't beautiful and it doesn't bring us some sort of temporary happiness, but it's that, it's temporary happiness. The, the lattes end, the books get finished. We have to restock the merchandise. So it's a lot of shiny stuff and it's easy to get caught there, but you're amongst people that dare to go further. So you're, you're required to get yourself out of your own way as you push yourself through the reflection of that rose-colored mirror, right? Enter very much what we call the bardo. Like if any of you are karma yogis, you remember from training, like internally we call it the bardo. Uh, it's that realm where it's that in-between space. We're going to talk about it a lot tonight, but that in-between space between uh, the end of one thing and the start of something else. Uh, and it's a lot of shedding. It's, you, it's, it's where our bathrooms are. It's where you put all your belongings. And then you enter the, the studio space, which is designed to really not give you too many handholds. Nothing on the walls, no words, no pictures, no Tibetan tankas or anything like that. Um, not because those things aren't, uh, not, a, not that they're not able to bring up something beautiful in your mind, but we're rather just interested in giving you the space to ask yourself, what is in my mind? Where would my mind go if I were to sit there forever? So I'm curious how that landed for y'all. Feel free to chime in um, if anyone had any strong reactions to that. Mm. And then meanwhile, I'll just situate us as to where we are in the course. So we've done a lot. Right, we went over, we started with like this super structure of the desire form and formless realms, the different types of beings that inhabit those realms, which remember are right here. They're not on some different planet or in some different universe. They're right here just through a different lens of perception. So as real as, um, the way I see the world is versus the way Sam sees the world. They're, they're both valid. They're both real. And they're also kind of not by choice. I wish I could see the world through Sam's eyes. I could try, but I just can't. So there's a lot there, but we've talked a lot about, right? Like keep asking yourself, these beings that we're talking about, where do they live? Do they, could they still exist even though I haven't seen them before? All things you should ask yourself. Don't believe them just because I'm sharing them or because I have photos on, images on a slide. Buddhism is very clear about that. Um, cut it against your own logic and your own understanding. But then today we're going to talk about bardo beings and then that'll bring us to halfway in the course. And then, then uh, it gets to the part of the Abhidharma Kosha, which is like kind of the closest um, or the most 
Mm, I guess I don't know if that's true, so I don't want to say that, but it contains like Buddhist metaphysics and cosmology. So we'll have a class on the types of sustenance and the physical world. Um, we'll talk about the lives of hell beings, and then I'm excited for the class on time, space, and eons. That'll get fun, and then we'll end the course with a death meditation. Which remember, and we're, we'll talk about this even today, death meditation is not, me it's not the meditation you do on your deathbed. That's not what we're talking about here. That's not what this course is covering. Um, it's rather the meditation you do when you open your eyes in the morning and decide how you're going to live your day. So it's really a meditation on living, uh, but with the idea of every moment is a preparation for death, known or unknown. But if it's true that the moments of your mind, no one else is going to get them. No one else has to suffer the consequences or reap the rewards of what you put into your mind. Then everything is, is preparation for death. So I just wanted to let you all know where we were in the course. I think, I actually don't think I have a review slide from last week, but maybe I'll just pause here before we go into class five. Any questions on last week? Any things that didn't sit well with people? Or how is the meditation on the six types of suffering of being a human? Hi Zoe, I see you joined. Any reactions or questions come up? All right, I'll take that as a no. Nothing, everyone's on the same page about that. Okay. Okay, so let's dive in. So, where do I want to begin? Okay, the Bardo realm. A couple of things before we get into. Um, Supri, I was searching on my notes and I just found it. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, I mean, it's not a question. It's just kind of a, a something that came up around the six sufferings. And in the reading itself, there's so much talk about like, please, you know, I don't know what the translation is, but please consider life with this kind of disgust. <laughs> for example so now you see life is suffering now you see that you shed your skin I hope you understand this is disgusting <laughs> life is despair um, including the thing about rebirths being one of the sufferings and it's saying it's it's shitty to keep being reborn and I was just curious about I guess more the culture of the the world that has that attitude around the, that concludes those things. I would personally like to conclude that being reborn is a great, great gift. And I would like to conclude actually on deeper meditation about impermanence, that it's a great gift rather than something disgusting. And uh, that's something that just came up for me. And I wondered if it's partly a cultural thing, like how the, the commentators, you know, the world they lived in, et cetera, or, you know, how you think of that conceptually, where that kind of conclusion comes from. Yeah, I'd love to, before I respond, um, give a chance for anyone else who maybe had that come up for them mm. to chime in. Yeah, that'd be great. Because if you've been to any ACI classes, you know, we've, we've done the first truth, life is suffering. So what, how have you reached some sort of uh, understanding there? How do you work with that? I saw some heads nodding as Marissa was speaking. So please just mute yourself and chime in. Um, I can add a quick thought that comes to my mind in response to Marissa's share, and that being that I've wondered sometimes that uh, when the Buddha set out on his journey uh, toward, like on his spiritual path, like when the Buddha gained stream entry, if you want to use that language, for him, like his first experience was 
it was like characterized by suddenly becoming aware of suffering which he had been shielded from for most of his life and i have wondered in some ways about how like like our first impressions of people color our perspective of them and it's really hard to shake off that first impression and i've sometimes wondered if like because the buddha had this like very unique life where he was completely shielded from suffering and then he suddenly was like overwhelmed with it when he went on that chariot ride i wondered if like that really colored his perspective strongly to the point that that became his conclusion that life is suffering um so i'm curious um if there are any reflections on that I can share. Um, I definitely, like, in the beginning of my ACI studies, I was, like, dabbing in and out of class, and I got, like, tidbits of this, and I remember specifically being in Urban Outfitters and actually talking to Supriya on the phone about how I was feeling, like, so dark about the world. Like, I'm, like, it's it's just depressing. Like, there's, I've reached this, like, depressing point in, in ACI where, like, I can't stop looking at the suffering of life. It was almost like that was the only thing I could see as I'm like standing there trying to like buy another shirt, you know? Um, but then I kind of had to just like sit with that and really think about it in terms of the people around me. Like, yeah, we're all going through this cycle together of um, good and bad and this realizing the suffering helped me actually open my heart and access feelings that I didn't know were like there um, because I, I realized how precious it was to have the people around me that were around me and like how like much depth there, there is to people and how can I um, try to remove that those like bad times from people. So it, it gave me this bigger sense of compassion and also made me look at the world in a less like linear cyclical way. So um, I'm happy to chat further, Marissa, about like how I, I definitely reached like a dark point where I was like, this is so weird, you know, like I don't want to be thinking about suffering all the time, but it, it transforms the more that you kind of like sit with it. Actually, just to be clear, um, I, I don't feel dark in any way about any of it. Uh, and I feel like I've met it. I saw like I've seen and been in deep, deep suffering in my life when I was younger. And my conclusion has been it, exactly what you just said, Mackenzie, that actually it's beautiful. And I what I found interesting was that the language of the commentary and that these like, you know, teachers on the lineage of this path didn't seem to comment on that part. They just focused on text that would say something like, so therefore you see how gross this is, um, which I found interesting since I have come to a different conclusion after meditating on suffering for many years. And I believe that you, you know, you came to that conclusion too. And I believe that like, many people do come to that conclusion that it's actually very beautiful life <laughs> um and even like you know more beautiful to see the wholeness of it all so i was wondering if if the teachers themselves who wrote these texts you know have not come to those same conclusions or if there's a mm. kind of cultural reason why they didn't why they specifically focused on that side of the lens yeah, I think I'd like to chime in. I think that they came to those same conclusions. I think the teaching is for the younger version of you that hadn't seen suffering yet. Um, especially as Biggie was saying earlier, like you know, the the Buddha never saw suffering. So possibly his greatest gift was that seeing it for the first time really did color his opinion. And he looked and he's like, wait a minute, like, if Biden beats Trump, 
it's not going to change anything. People are still going to be poor. They're still going to die. They're still going to suffer emotionally, physically. Like there's got to be something better. And that's the, that's the path out of suffering. And that's the beauty that is in front of us every day. If only we could just lift the veil. So it's like you've seen life is suffering and now it's gone. You're on the path already. And if, you know, if life is beautiful, then you're almost there. You're so far more advanced than so many of the rest of us. And that's why we have to be bodhisattvas and help everybody else. That help? Yeah. Yeah, that, awesome. that helps. That helps. I could offer something. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's more like um, sort of a disclaimer, uh, kind of like, like I've, uh, I've been taught in this way around food. So you see food, like you can see an incredible, beautiful plate of food and you're, and, and you, uh, all of your senses are excited by it and you put it in your mouth and you chew it. And if I took that food out of your mouth and, and tried to get you to eat it, the way it looked, it's disgusting looking. And the, the languaging of that is like, just because it is beautiful, it's also still impermanent. And so that, that idea of it being disgusting is a way of like cutting very quickly through um, any delusion around things being lasting and permanent. So I don't think of it so much as like, oh, this is just disgusting. We, we shouldn't even um, deal with it because it's just disgusting. Just leave it behind. It's more like it's, it might be beautiful, but it's only beautiful in this particular form in which you're experiencing it. And actually, it's also disgusting if you were to like sort of reconfigure the parts. And because of that, uh, don't get attached to it. I think that's kind of where that language comes from. Yeah, I resonate with that, um, David, and and I found a lot of merit in the meditation of uh, actually developing a sense of disgust feels like the, it's, it's a loaded word, but renunciation for this life, for the things that appear in this life. And the reason I say that is because I don't know if you all have sort of a personification of samsara in your mind, right? Like if samsara were a character, what would their personality be like? And for a while, I, I, in my mind, samsara was like an oaf, you know, like this incompetent, sort of inferior, suffering thing, you know? And I, I would look down upon it and be like, oh, it's, it's this thing. It doesn't need to exist. It's suffering. It's samsara. Um, and only recently, I've discovered that samsara is actually quite sophisticated. Like samsara knows how to deliver tricks to me, as in to create things. And again, remember, I, I, I'm creating samsara. So I'm saying this with that understanding, but it can create things that look a lot like wisdom or happiness or some sort of ease. Uh, but it's like, a, it's like a magic trick. It's like an illusion, right? Why do we use that word? While you're in it, you're, you're, you believe it it seems real, even though maybe a part of you knows it's not. Uh, and those tricks, it can, it, it's not just surface level stuff. It's even the way I see myself. Um, and so to David's point, it's not about becoming an expert about samsara or even becoming an expert about enlightenment. Really, all we have to become an expert on is the thing that causes us to see either samsara or enlightenment. Because it's the same thing. The same thing that causes me to see the true nature of everything in samsara, meaning that it actually lacks a nature, it doesn't have any sufferingness from its own side. That same understanding is the thing that would make enlightenment possible. The complete eradication of any causes that would actually bring suffering about. So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's how I've, I've worked with it. Um, I don't see a beauty in suffering. If there's a lesson I've learned from my own suffering, which there are many, 
I wouldn't call that beauty. I, I wouldn't say that the cause of that lesson, the cause of that wisdom, that teaching for me was the suffering because like produces like. So that suffering didn't produce that realization. It was some other prior insight or realization that then produced the next one. I just have the order of the dominoes, kind of, the domino pieces wrong. That's the way I've worked with it. Um, I see an LOL by David. I don't know what that's for exactly, but I think it's, it's definitely worth examining. Um, we said that uh, birds would like it if, if you fed them chewed up food. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, because I, I, and like what a lot of you were referring to, the bodhisattva ideal, I think of that a lot as being in the world, but not of the world, right? I think that's a Ramnas thing. You are in the world. You are working and interacting with people. You are going to the cafe and, and meeting up with people, right? You're in the world, but you're not of the world, as in you're not fooled by the way things seem to appear or the things they seem to bring up in you. And rather you have that uh, courage, it really does feel like courage often, to be like, is that thing out there making me angry? Is that thing out there? Is the suffering just entrenched out there all the way down? It's just, you know, is it, is it outside of me at all? Is any part of it outside of me? And we, we give hundreds of proofs, right, as to kind of wrestling your mind into seeing, no, it couldn't be that way. If it were that way, it would always be that way. No one would benefit from a corrupt system if the system was corrupt from its own side. If I see it to be that way, and, and not by choice, by force, there's something in my mind participating there. The only thing I have control over is that direction, my mind out. What is my mind projecting? So we meditate to slow down that time and catch that. Or we, take, uh, we, we watch our morality, because that clears up a lot of things. Mm, it actually, the, the talk, the, um, like Sarah and Adam and I were at this beautiful teaching and uh, this woman, Tata, was sharing this and it had me thinking exactly about this, where so much of this path isn't about being like, it's not adding a view to your toolbox, right? Being like, oh, these are all the ways to look at the world. Here's another one. It's actually removing a bunch of stuff. It's removing all the things that are clouding our vision. Uh, and then what you're left with is seeing what's really there. How does my mind really participate in the world? I don't know if you've cut that, Sarah and Adam, but it made me think of this. When she said, and I think she even said, it's what we get caught in is our selfishness. Which when I hear selfishness, I think self-existing-ishness, right? Like the fact that we think not only that I have a self, but that everything in the world has some sort of inherent self and nature. And it's radiating that nature all the time. And therefore, the world's out to get me. Or the opposite, the world is for my taking. And neither of those things are true, is what we're I saying. love that definition of selfishness. That's great. I can't even pronounce it, but yeah. Anytime, I mean, it's really, it's a coded thing. Any, the, the way the word self or ego came from Eastern philosophy into the West, I find it really hard to work with as just self. Because there is a self when we say there is no self. Um, but if you think of it as there's no self-existence, as in there's no self inherent, unchanging, that has the essence of that thing in it, that's the self we're denying. That's the one we're saying it never was there. It never will be there. And the lack of that, the fact that that doesn't exist, that is the definition of emptiness. Right? Emptiness is the lack of something. And it's saying that thing, that self-existent thing, it's not, it's not going to be there. And that's the reason I could look at myself as su suffering Supriya or because I don't, la I don't have that nature. I could see myself in a completely different form, in a completely different surrounding with a completely different type of mind. It's because of that, self that lack of self-existence. I see some furrowed brows, and I know we get to a lot of double negatives here, but stay with me and, and hopefully we can keep revisiting. Okay, so now we're into the Bardo realm. Couple things before I put things on the slide. So Bardo, 
Um, when I heard Geshe-la teach this, he said pardo, like as if there was an H there. So perhaps that's the true pronunciation, pardo. Um, you, you'll hear it often as bardo. I had some of my favorite English teachers, the ones who taught me pedagogy of the oppressed my senior year of high school were Mr. and Mrs. Bardo. So I think of them, but Bardo or Bardoa, you also hear it as that. Um, Bardo means in between. And what we're specifically talking about that in between state, uh, between one death and the next rebirth. So right from there, um, know that this whole study on Bardo, the, the, the realm and the beings in it, which all come from Abhidharma Kosha, uh, chapter, I can never remember if it's chapter three or chapter four. I think this one is chapter four, this course. Uh, but it's all about Master Vasubandhu, Abhidharma Kosha. But anyways, um, what I'm trying to say is that any teaching you have on the Bardo assumes that you do believe something happens, that something exists at the moment after death. Right, if you didn't believe that, then none of these things, then this is all just make-believe. Um, so this sort of presumes that you ha have, it, have an understanding of it, or at least haven't completely tossed it out as a impossibility. So here we've talked a lot about, yes, the, the body ends. No doubt about it. But you have no proof that the mind, this sort of mental continuum, ends at that moment. And what happens to that mental continuum? That's where these teachings become relevant. Um, and we're really lucky to have this commentary from the Abhidharma Kosha because more than almost any other thing in, in Buddhism, the teachings on the Bardo realm, on this really precious time between death and rebirth, are the things that have been corrupted the most. Um, and when I say corrupted, I don't think it's people being like, oh, let me, you know, I don't think it's a malicious intent. It's just like if you were to play a game of telephone, right? Like the message gets degraded. Uh, all of these words are so negative, but like the message gets changed. It just inevitably does. So imagine this traveling through 2,500 years of human existence and culture and ways of expressing ourselves. It's, it's, it's become changed. Um, so this is a really beautiful original source that we have about Bardo teachings. Um, and the, the most detailed one in the open or the sutra teachings that we have. So that's a little bit of context. Mm, okay, so, oh, one thing to remember, we talked about the different types of birth, right? In one of these classes, a couple classes ago, right? You could be born from a womb, you could be born from an egg, from warmth and moisture. Um, one thing to know is that the abardo being is said to be born complete. Remember the creepy dude with the six pack, the marble guy on the slide? As the image of born complete, as in you just pop into existence fully formed. And that's how these bardo beings are said to exist. So upon the moment of death, mind continues into the next moment and the projection that the mind creates of your own body, right? Right now, you are having a projection of your own body. So just get used to when I say the word projection, it's not that it's not real. This is a projection. This is what makes it real. I'm forced to experience this, but it's a projection from my own mind because some other creature comes in here and they don't see this and say, oh, there's Supriya's arm. There's her mala adorning her arm and all her rings and stuff. It's an arm. It's a Supriya arm. No, it doesn't have that nature from this side. So it is a projection. I'm forced to perceive it as my arm. I couldn't help it if I tried. If I put it on a hot stove, I will pull away. Instinct, impulse. So it is a projection in the same way uh, the, the mind at, after the moment of death entering the bardo realm would take on the or would spew out a projection of a fully formed bardo being born complete as in you don't have like a bardo adolescence and then you know grow up a little bit or anything you don't have a bardo mom and dad or bardo parents 
Um, so that's what they say about the appearance and something to note, a bardo takes the appearance of the being that it will become. And it's really confusing because they call that being the being before which I understand is super confusing. I read it multiple times to confirm, but here's what I mean. So let's say, so they say a bardo being's body is made out of like this subtle physical matter. So let's say you were a human, you had a death, you're entering the bardo realm and your next rebirth is going to be as a hell being, right? So we've talked about that's already kind of predetermined uh, in that, the karma that appeared to your mind, that, that mm, I wanna rephrase that. If karma is the movement of your mind, right? The last karma that you had, it's called the projecting karma at the moment of death. If that, based on all the karmas that came before it, not just in that life, but beginning this time, if that karma has the flavor, has the projecting power of next life will be a hell being, your bardo personality will be that of a hell, a, 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 of a being that's about to become a hell being. So they say they would look like charred wood and they'd be traveled, like they'd be walking upside down. Uh, they'd see the world sort of backwards or upside down. Um, and they have a whole list. They say if your next rebirth was gonna be as a preta or a hungry ghost craving spirit, you'd have the, appearance like a translucent appearance like water animals would appear grayish like smoke um, humans appear golden apparently so again human a human bardo uh, a bardo being that will become a human would have this golden hue um, and look childlike so like not a fully formed adult and then devas and form realm beings look like fully formed and clothed adults. And then what do you think a formless bardo being would look like? Trick question, I see confused faces. So formless realm, right? Being there is no form, you have no body. Um, and so, yeah, I think, Zoe, you got it. You, there, there is no bardo being equivalent for a formless rebirth. That mind just goes from previous moment of mind to next moment of mind in the formless realm because there's no form. There's no physical matter associated with it. So Priya, can I just ask, um, how do we know this stuff? Is it enlightened beings who have been able to like meditate to their past lives. Like I'm just thinking about like, you know, how would a, a hell being or a hungry ghost, like even think to like write down what they experienced during, during the Bardo. It's beautiful question, Mackenzie. It's the next thing that we're going to get to. And this whole class is actually this more than any other type of being. How can you prove its existence? So we're going to go over some logical proofs to prove the existence, but also some scriptural proofs. Um, and this should all just be like fodder for your mind to sit with. But to your point, one of the aspects of bardo beings is that they can only see each other. As in, if you were a part of a bardo being that was uh, like a pre-hell realm bardo being, right? You were in bardo hell, I think that's what they call it. You could only see other bardo hell beings or if you were in um, bardo deva form, right? And like a god or goddess, you could only see others of that type. Um, so that's one thing, but that doesn't answer your question uh, here. How could one of us see them? They say that one of the ways is developing this meditative vision called the eye of God. And what that entails is uh, they don't list what the 11 meditation obstacles are, but they say, if you were to clear 11 meditation obstacles from your mind, you could have this clear vision called the eye of God. 
right? If any of you all have meditated before, you realize that your capacity to see doesn't just go away because your eyes are closed. You're still perceiving things. So they say, they, they don't list what these 11 are, but Hector mentioned it's also in the Diamond Cutter Sutra. He said one of them is doubt. One of them is subtle dullness in the mind. But basically, if you can clear away those 11 things, you can get this meditative insight where you would actually be able to see beings that are in the bardo realm. Would you also need the direct perception of emptiness to have the eye of God? Mm, Hector or Geshela did not say that. So I'm not sure. Um, a couple things they did share though. So that's sort of all that's included in the open or sutra teachings. There are tantric teachings about being able to see bardo beings so that you could reach them and actually help them and actually try to help them. So those teachings do exist. Um, the, the closest form to that that we have, you might have heard of this, like, you know, if you've ever um, asked a Buddhist teacher for sort of, let's say someone you love has passed away um, and you say, you know, what, what do I do? Is there anything I can do? And some really beautiful uh, advice that I've got is think of, it's also, it also is logical, but think of all the happiest memories that you can of that person, right? Think of them in their, the prime of their health. Think of them doing goodness. Think of them doing the thing that fulfilled their life. And the reason being that there's some, there's some pull between our minds here and their minds in the Bardo realm, and it would allow their minds to go towards something virtuous, right? If they, they could, it's like they could feel, um, is, is sort of the idea that others pulling their mind in that positive direction. Um, that's sort of the, the, all I could glean from the classes about that, Mackenzie trying to see if I have anything on here. Oh, and this okay, is related you. to this next thing because they say the lifespan of a bardo being, it could be as short as a few seconds or like a millisecond. It could be that quick. Um, or it could be at max seven lifetimes, seven bardo lifetimes of seven days each. So you might've heard of you know rituals of someone passes and for 49 days, you do this meditation um, to bring their minds to that place. So you think of them for 49 days. You know, Hector did that when his mom passed, for example. So that's where that 49 comes from, seven times seven. But to Mackenzie's question, let's go into some proofs. Like, where's the logic in this? What is this place that, you know, we're saying the Bardo realm? So the logical proof, it's coming via, I feel like I probably misspelled that. I think it's Chin Jampe Yang, C-H-I-N, not C-H-I-M. But I'll correct that before I send out the slides. Um, but here, the proof they present is you can't go from a seed into a plant without some intermediate stage. It's the nature metaphor again, but they're saying, okay, there's a continuum between seed and plant, but it doesn't just go seed, soil, water, sunshine, boom, plant. Like there's some intermediate, there's a sprout. Uh, or if you wanna use another metaphor, and this is the other one they say, you know, it's a, it's a place thing. The idea of this realm, it does have a place. It does have a location. Just because we can't see it, there's still a location. And if I were to go from one location to another, if I were to go from here to Hawaii, I'd have to have a layover. Like I wouldn't, I can't just apparate. There's some intermediary. Um, and all they're saying is that intermediary, that in between is the bardo. It's a state of travel in, if you, if you can get on board with the idea that it's, there's a continuum between death and life, death and the next life, that there's something that sustains. If that's the case, there must be an in-between stage. 
I think that summarizes it here. A plant cannot come directly from a seed. There must be an intermediary in that same way. Rebirth in one location cannot come directly from the being at death in another. There must be a bardo being. Um, because we have time, I want to share something. Uh, I'm just checking the chat. Uh, I want to share something here. I hope, I don't know if anyone from the debate group is here to help me out. I don't know if Jane or Tyler. Oh, Christina, I see you. This is partially a plug for the debate group, which we have, I think it's still going on on Wednesday nights. Um, but it's also in the reading, they present a really cool debate, at least it helped me a lot, about this. So they say that, you know, this guy named Chin Jampe Young gave this logic, right? Being like, oh, here's the proof of why Bardo realms exist. And then someone countered him saying, well, there doesn't always have to be an intermediary in a continuum. For example, if I were to look at myself in a mirror, there's no intermediary there. There's me and there's a reflection in the mirror. And even if I backed up 10, 50, 100 feet, my reflection's still there. There's no in-between state, right? Between me and that reflection. That's the counter that they present. Hey, what about that? Uh, right, which any of you know, Tibetan debate, that's how it works. You sort of put out a statement and then you get a counter. And so, Chin Jampe Yang, or yeah, I think it's him, basically says, he, he rebuts that, that idea by saying, hey, well, the example that you're giving for two reasons is not a good example. And we can't actually use this to debate. Um, reason number one, it's a bad example, is because the reflection that exists in the mirror doesn't exist in the same way that I do. Right? It's not like I'm in the mirror because mirror is in the mirror. There are two, there, it's, a, it's a reflection and it's a, and it's a physical thing. And according to physics, as well as Buddhist physics, you can't have two distinct things occupying the same space at the same time, right? So in that mirror, there can't be both Supriya and mirror. There's just mirror that happens to reflect Supriya's reflection. So they say, one, those two things that you're talking about, the reflection and the person being reflected, they don't exist in the same way. So that for one, that's for one reason, bad example. But the other reason is that, hey, what you're describing in terms of me and a mirror, it's not a continuum in the way we're talking about with death and rebirth. There's no continuum between me and my reflection in the mirror. How do I know this? The thing that's necessary for me to see a reflection in the mirror it's just two things I need necessary, right? Two causes. I need a me and I need a clean mirror. Those are the causes that create reflection in mirror. But in a continuum, the understanding is that the moment prior is the thing that creates the moment after. It's a continuum, A to B to C. Right, and, that, and that's the type of thing we're talking about. It's called a continuum cause, even. It's a cause that cause A flops into cause B and, and so on. Rather than, here's me, here's a mirror, the two causes came together and you see the image. So they're saying basically bad analogy. You can't, it doesn't work. Um, I don't know if that helps anyone else. It really helped me. It's in the reading. I enjoyed it, but so I recommend it. Mm, anything else here? So that, that's the main logical proof that basically there must be sort of an in-between uh, space. But the other proof that's presented, and I think this one we really have to uh, 
Okay, good, Jing. I'm glad it's, I'm not a logic expert at all. So I definitely, I'm really curious to learn, but I'm glad that landed. And there's also some logic classes uh, taught by really skilled teachers on the Three Jewels YouTube channel, if you're interested more in like Buddhist debate and logic. Mm. Okay, so this other proof, which comes from scripture, the caveat here, mm, okay, how do I describe this? Basically what we're going through here is like a statement by the Buddha, which almost as like, an afterthought mentions bardo beings. So the idea here is if that you were a person that really perceived a Buddha, a mind that's completely awake to the nature of reality. Mind you, a mind that is not capable of lying. Then you could take that being's words on authority. Right? If you were that, like, if you had that relationship to this being we called the Buddha, then you could accept a scriptural proof, right? Where he just mentions bardo beings offhand and you're like, okay, cool. That means bardo beings must exist. So that's what we're going through here. I'm not asking you to believe it because the Buddha said it. I'm asking you to think about what is a Buddha? Do you believe that it's possible? How would you become one? Um... So that's, yeah, that's that. But you'll see here, basically the scripture that they're, um, that they're quoting of the Buddha, it has to do with what, I think someone asked, like, what are the conditions for being born in a womb? Yeah, like, how, how, how does a being in a womb come to be? And the Buddha said, oh, well, if these three conditions come together, then you could perceive yourself as being in a womb. Uh, and those three conditions are one, the presence of a being suitable to being a mother. So like that is like the condition of fertility, right? Let's say um, the second one would be the con a, a feeling of desire between two partners. So the condition of some sort of sexual contact or union. And then three, oh, I didn't say this, but one of the definitions of bardo is smell eater. As in they can exist off of smells. They don't need like a physical food or sustenance to live. We're gonna talk later about um, types of sustenance, or as, as in later this week, next class. So when they say proximity of a smell eater, that's proximity of a bardo being. They need the condition of a bardo being uh, nearby. If those three things can come together, then the experience of being in a womb occurs, right? So this was like a completely, you know, it's just a scripture about that. And because this mentions a bardo being, you could take it as a proof that they must exist. But to break down more kind of what is being described here, because it's seemingly confusing if you just take it like this, uh, the idea is, let's say at your moment of death, uh, your mind through projection forces on you another rebirth as a human. Right? So you're entering the Bardo realm, you're entering a human. Um, intermediate state. They say what happens is that in the distance you see two people making love. And from where you are, you see that act and you th and it brings up a sense of pleasure for you. It brings up this sense of like, oh, it looks like they're having a great time. Um, you feel like this attraction to it, they say. Th those are conditions one and two. There's some uh, fertile being and they're in sexual contact with another fertile being. And you as a bardo being travel there. Um, and it's odd. They say that like the attraction is so strong. It's like you want to become a part of the act. That's sort of the feeling that you have. And that 
desire, that mistaken desire, right? You, you see what they're doing as from its own side, pleasurable, from its own side, bringing happiness. And so you like have this sense of wanting to partake and that's where things, uh, that's basically where things start to solidify. So they say bardo beings are like almost these ethereal like creatures. It's a very subtle physical body. They can travel through, I don't know if, I thought I had this on a slide, but they can, maybe it's later, but they can do things like travel at an incredible speed or travel through surfaces that, or, you know, we talked about pretas, for example, being like almost translucent, right? They don't have, um, like a physical sheath the way we do. But the idea is when that desire of wanting to partake in this like physical act comes up, they see their parents from afar and they're like, I wanna be part of that. The next moment they see themselves basically surrounded by something physical and something solid and opaque, AKA the womb. So it's those three conditions come together, plus the mind, you know, the, 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 as they say, the proximity of a bardo being, and that's what creates um, the experience of being in a womb. This summarizes it. Hey, Supriya. Yes. Do the scriptures or the text say anything about, like, from what distance? Like, I, I'm just trying to imagine, like, let's say someone dies and becomes a bardo being, uh, and they have like 49 days or so to become uh, human again. And how far can they be reincarnated from where they died? Like, is there anything about that? And does that question make sense? I think the question makes sense um, to me. I can't remember there being anything about it, but that doesn't mean there isn't. Uh, are you speaking from, so okay, from a time perspective, what I would say, and like we've talked about with other realms, the perception of time will be different, right? So whatever we feel as a human to be 49 days for a Bardo realm being, it might be a finger snap. So that's one thing on time. And in terms of location, uh, I don't know. I don't know. So the way okay. that, oh, sorry, maybe. No, I was just saying thank you. The way that you described um, a, a being in the Bardo, like taking birth again as a human, would you say that as humans, we all have the karma to see um, fertility as like something of pleasure? Mm, I'm not sure I understand your question exactly. So a, a person who has the karma to, who, who's in the bardo and has the karma to come back as a human mm -hmm. is the only way they come back as a human that they have the karma to see two people making love as pleasure and like they want to be a part of it. Yeah, that's the driving force, they say, in the mind. And, and like, there might be teachings like this on animals and other realms, but we only are presented with the one about humans. But it is that uh, mistaken perception. I'm not saying that there can't be pleasure in, uh, in sexual contact or sexual union. It's just the idea that is the pleasure inherent in it? Is it out there in it? And is the way to get that pleasure just to um, get closer to it? do whatever you need to do to get closer to it. It's, that's, the, that's like the first mistake. And it's that drive of pleasure of something outside of you, thinking that, oh, participating in that act will make me feel good without investigating the causes of that, right? Investigating really where that pleasure would come from. Um, it's that thought, that force of desire that sets off the chain reaction of then actually having a rebirth as a human. Gotcha. And it's the desire realm, right? Because it may, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I'm just reading the chat. 
It's yeah, interesting but... that you're all making, bringing up the Tibetan Book of the Dead. This is not my commentary on it at all. I also haven't read it, but it was something that Geshe Michael brought up in the, in the, uh, when he taught this course in the 1990s, the first time he taught it, that the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, um, which is maybe different than the one you're referring to, Thomas, but that that is actually one of those things that was subject to like a spiritual telephone game. That it, it, it doesn't actually retain the teachings on the Bardo realm the way, uh, for example, a direct commentary on the Abhidharma Kosha would. But he just leaves it at that. He doesn't really go into any more detail. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. does the And my connection cut out, so I'm sorry if you already said this, but um, does the amount of time that you're in the Bardo uh, like connect it all to your karma? Like, and I know you said time is different and like kind of non-existent, but in let's say like human days, one person's in Bardo for 49 days, one person's in for like 300. Does it, is there any like connection or are people, people always in the Bardo for the same amount of time? Like I'm also thinking about like spirits or, or souls who like don't know that they're crossing over, which I know is like not this territory necessarily, but they like get stuck and, mm -hmm. and kind of like, sometimes might need some guidance or they're just like always in limbo. I don't know. Yeah. Um, your question makes me think of, and I think we'll get to it on the class on time, but one thing that does happen, any realm that you enter, this realm right here, the Bardo realm, an animal realm, um, something that does happen is that your memory and perception of the passage of time gets filtered through the mind that's forcing you to have that realm. So what I mean is that if I, Supriya, were to take rebirth as a dog, that dog wouldn't see the world as, oh, remember when I used to be Supriya and then I got reborn as a dog, right? Mm -hmm. Even your memories happen through the lens of the being that you become, the being that you're projecting yourself to see. The same way now, I have zero doubt that I'm a human and I've always been a human. Like, I cannot conceive of a past or a future life. In, in, maybe in a meditation, they say it's possible. But do you see what I mean? Like, every part of your mind, including your memory and logic and all of that, is filtered through the type of mind that you, you are forced to have. So my mm -hmm. thought is that a Bardo realm being doesn't see themselves as in an in-between space. They just see themselves as, oh, this is my existence. And the the things that they find themselves doing or not doing, just like us, it's a result of everything that's happened before. Mm -hmm. It's the habit that they have. So that, would, that might change the way you behave in a Bardo realm, but the idea is that the force of that karma, that propulsion is already so strong. You're just being thrown into this little intermediary state, wiping out some karmas before you then get reborn as your next thing. Does that help? I don't know if that gets to your question, but. Yes, yes and no. I'm also reading the comments and Let's like see. I understand that it's time free and then there's like a piece of me that still wants to put it in some sort of linear. I'm like, I know it's, I know it's time free for them, but if we had to measure it, I, I get, yeah, just is there, how long does it take? I know it's gonna be different for, Every yeah, all, all I've heard and everything is that, yeah, it's different for every being. It could be a millisecond. It could be 49 days. There was no, like, commentary I saw that that one was better than another. You know, that it's better to have a short Bardo being lifetime versus a longer one. Yeah. My sense of it was very much that, like, you don't have too much control during that time. It's just yeah. that, that, again, if that's my read on it, that, like, there's not that much free will, let, let's say, like that. It's more whatever flavor you already had in your mind, you're just going to be forced to act upon that. Um, that was got the sense I got. Thank you. Yeah. And then Camilla, to your question about beings that were sent to the moon, but then aborted intentionally, um, any literature on that? 
I can't think of the exact literature, but I do know that in Buddhist thought, based on, on what we see here, that the idea is that the first moment of mind, well, I guess there isn't a first moment of mind. The idea is that mind is beginningless and endless. But uh, in terms of how you would perceive other beings, a mind is said to be created at the moment of this contact, of these three conditions coming together. So then, I don't know if your question is about the experience of uh, the being in the womb itself or the beings outside of the womb. I guess it would change depending on that. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah, I'd say uh, inside the womb, like would they be sent back or? Mm, I think I would just say that that would be like a really, and you know, short being relative, you don't know their experience of time, but that would be the, the duration of their uh, human realm existence. And then, yes, according to this system, until you become enlightened, until you come outside of the cycle of suffering, the wheel of suffering, you are just cycling through all these realms with in-between states uh, endlessly. So as soon as one existence ends, you're entering another bardo based on what happened in that existence, and then that end projected into the next rebirth. And it's like that. It's birth, bardo, rebirth. Birth, death, bardo, rebirth. It's that. That's the cycle of suffering, the cycle of life. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let me see if I have anything else. I think I might. Okay, I have a couple more things on them. Um, do you all see what I mean by like, if you've taken any ACI classes, this has a very different flavor. Um, I definitely, you know, struggled with it. So keep the questions coming. This is another uh, few pieces of information on bardo beings. And this comes from the first Dalai Lama. Um, if you remember his commentary, I think it's called, I think it's called Illumination on the Path to Freedom, is the commentary we're studying on Abhidharma Kosha. And this information comes from there. So this is what I was talking about a little bit. Um, intermediate beings have like special powers, apparently. They can do things like fly through the sky, travel at extraordinary speeds, and pass through mountains. Um, and then, this was, I feel like I heard this in some of your questions, but wasn't uh, able to hear it clearly. My fault, not yours. Um, is it possible to divert your next rebirth from within the bardo realm? Right? Like, let's say you find yourself as a bardo hell being. You're like, wait a minute, I don't want to go there. Can you do anything at that time? And so Gendun Drupa, um, the first Dalai Lama, says, you can never be diverted to another birth. The energy of your past deeds that's throwing forth the intermediate or bardo being headed for the hells is the same energy that will project the hell being itself. Remember that being before terminology that we talked about? Um, the one exception that he gives though is one can however reach the state of an intermediate being headed for the level known as class of the pure, AKA Nirvana. So basically, what this is saying is that it is possible to achieve a state of nirvana from a bardo being existence. For those of you, or for those who haven't heard the term nirvana before, can someone give me a definition? You have no more mental afflictions? Yes, cool. It's the permanent cessation of all mental afflictions. 
all those words are important. Permanent, never, happen, never an angry day again, never a sad day again, or even moment. Um, cessation, an ending of all mental afflictions. Afflictions being anything that bothers your state of mind. Anything that is not perfect happiness that you understood how that happiness came to be. Anything that's not that is a mental affliction. There we go, I had to finish my train of thought. So what it's saying here is that it is possible to achieve nirvana as a bardo being, mm. but everything surrounding this commentary says, don't try this. Like if you're exploring all the methods of how to reach nirvana, don't place your chips on this one. Don't think, hey, I'm gonna learn some special practice or special power that I will be able to do with my mind when I'm a bardo being, and then I can experience nirvana. Uh, so everyone at, at this point in the uh, class kind of reminds each other that the conditions that we have right now are the perfect ones for achieving that state. We have whatever degree of health you have, you have some leisure that, you've ha that you have two hours on a Tuesday night to log in here. I mean, you have something you can log in on. That's more than the majority of the beings on this planet. You have some, I'm not saying you paid attention every single minute of this, but you have some ability to, con a continuum of thought. You can decide what you wanna pay attention to, right? Some beings are so tortured by forces within or outside of them that they don't even have that ability. You have everything you need. You have access to the studies. You have access to the meditation techniques. They say, don't wait until this moment to reach nirvana. Do it before. Have the direct perception of emptiness in this life and get there. So don't let this be like a, um, I don't know what it's called, but Geshla says, don't, don't bet on it. Don't bet on this being the way you get there. And that might, oh yeah, that's all I've got actually on, on, oops, on Bardo beings. Um, so before we end, let me open it up. Are there questions or thoughts? Have, yeah. Um, I'm still a little confused about what happens in the event of a miscarriage or an abortion. Is that still a Bardo being because the birth actually hasn't happened yet? And then what happens to that Bardo being if that's the case? Yeah, great question. That's Pam, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I don't know the actual, I mean, I don't know, what I'm sharing is my understanding to, in response to your question, uh, because there's nothing in the reading or commentary about that. That okay. But my understanding would be that once the being is in the womb, they're no longer a bardo being. Right? So once those conditions of, once you, once you have a solidified existence within a human womb, you're not in that in-between state anymore. You're in a, hu you're in a uh, human state. Um, so then, okay. So it would be essentially a full cycle then with a death. It would, yeah, it would be your, it would, it would be that being's complete rebirth in that state, in, in that state of human, if it was a human womb or animal in an animal womb. Does, is that what you're asking? Yes, yeah. And thanks for the caveat that, um, you know, the literature, isn't clear on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm sure if you dug, there might be things. I mean, it, it definitely doesn't use the language. Um, just because this, you know, stuff is from 2,500 years ago. Uh, right. So I'm just trying to apply what, what, 
my understanding of this. And I, 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 do, I do feel confident in saying that they wouldn't be a Bardo being once there's solid stuff involved. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay. does that assume that actually the like time or the moment of birth is actually conception versus when you leave your mother or the, I mean, I know we went over types of birth and a lot of them, I mean, they all, unless you like come out a fully formed being, they mm -hmm. assume that time of birth is like the moment your mother pushes you out or you come from out of the egg or whatever. So in that, yeah case where like the the entity whatever the being dies in the womb or dies in the egg um is that assuming that like the time of birth is maybe then just the conception point the time of rebirth yeah i would say so okay. um, that's what like i i try to remember i wouldn't say that that's the first moment of mind because remember, mind is this beginningless thing. Right. 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 Mind being this thing that creates everything around it. Your mind right. is creating your experience of body, time, space, location, all of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not the first moment of mind, but it, I, from the information presented, I would say that it's the first moment of life in a human rebirth. First right. moment of existence in a human rebirth yeah okay. thank you yeah um Supriya, i have a question about the um the rebirth and reincarnation in general mm -hmm. are there yes. ever any new being like aside from the fact that we can die and like choose to come in different forms of rebirth are there ever any just new beings that have never existed are I hearing you right saying new beings? I'm sorry? You're, are you saying new, are, are there ever any new beings? Yeah, any, any new beings, like yeah. any- Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the first thing I think of is, like for example, you know, when this text talks about animal, animals, mm -hmm. they say there's, I think they said like 360 million different species, like more than we could imagine, way more than we've discovered. Right. right? Like we've only discovered less than 86% of all the species just on planet earth. So according to this text, there are infinite galaxies and planets or ga galaxies that contain planets just like this one and infinite beings on those. So the categories of beings that we're talking about, I'd say they're grouped together because they have a shared way of seeing and moving through the world, right? We call ourselves human. It's a convenience thing. If some other mm -hmm. form of America, or an animal doesn't look at all of us and say, oh, there's the human race. Um, but these categories are things that we make, that like they're very much things that we're constructing with our minds. It's that map or that structure that we're putting on reality. Um, so to your question, I think absolutely there are beings that are new in the form of like, they don't fit in this chart, they don't fit in a chart um, neatly. But the idea is that if they're at all within the chart, they're within suffering. You're either within it or you're outside of it, for real. Does that help? So I wouldn't say like this is a comprehensive course on every single type of those beings. There's definitely existences we just can't even imagine um, included within that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And anyone else please chime in now, um, especially those that have done this course before. I've only gone through this course once before actually and going through it again, I'm learning a lot more and I feel like there's still a lot more to to learn can you talk more about the it was it bardo beings that feed on the the sense of smell yeah i saw you make a face when i said that oh. yeah because at first i was like oh that's kind of like raunchy but then i'm like oh but like flowers and like perfume yeah i think 
it's a good precursor to what we'll talk about next week. So the idea about like, what do you need to subsist on to be alive, right? A human being, we need a certain amount of food and water to keep this machine alive. Uh, not all beings are like that. The sustenance that they need to stay alive is not necessarily food and water. So they say for Bardo beings, they have a subtle physical um, body. They don't eat Bardo food or drink Bardo water. They subsist on smells. Um, so they're called smell eaters. I don't know the Tibetan for that, but that's where it comes from. They don't go too much more into it. Yeah, that's kind of cool though. I'm like yeah. thinking about like space food and how that's like different from earth food and like bardo food. It's like you like open up, um, what are those things that kids eat, you know, with like the little crackers and the cheese and the ham? Oh, the Lunchables. <laughs> yeah, Lunchables with different smells. Yeah, and like we'll go over it in the next class, but things that we wouldn't expect are forms of sustenance. Like one of the main forms of sustenance they say is hope you know, a, a lot of beings, they just need hope to survive. Even if they get to the point of extreme dehydration or starvation, like a little bit of hope could keep their mind stream going. So that's a form of sustenance. Um, so yeah, for Bardo beings, they live on smells. Anything else or any thoughts um, also that have come up are totally welcome. Um, I have a meta kind of a question in mind and uh, maybe it comes from a, a very sapped out mental state with which I attended this class today. Um, but I'm just like wondering like what even is the point of like learning all like what these bardo beings do and it's like I imagine that if one were to become enlightened one would realize these things but is learning about these things and like remembering these things of any utility at all in the path towards enlightenment and i imagine like at some point the buddha was just like sharing a bunch of different things because he was like okay i've, I've you know i just want to share everything but why yeah i i'm feeling like very a strong lack of like a desire to like remember any of this um <laughs> And it's not like a desire, it's not a lack of desire to remember. I'm just really wondering, like, yeah, like, is this I something can give that... You, I can give you some motivation. I don't reason. need motivation specifically. Well, Let me clarify. I, I'm i rationale for learning... I, the, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump over you. No, no, I just want to be very specific about what I'm asking. The specific thing, thing I'm asking is, like, is this... Is this something that contributes to the progress towards enlightenment, or is this something that fits under just? Um, and I can't think of a kind of word for it, but there's like this thing called intellectual masturbation, right? It's like oh, just like let's play around in the world of ideas, right? And, and I'm I'm curious about well, that. I'm not looking for motivation specifically. Okay, so so not motivation, but. Um, if you don't get enlightened in this lifetime, you could get reborn as an animal, which puts you farther away from enlightenment. If you understand the bardo and what goes on during the bardo, at the moment of death, you can push yourself into another human birth. You can use your karma in such a way that you can literally push yourself into a better human birth, a human birth that allows you the time and the wealth and space, much like you have right now, to learn about that, to get closer to enlightenment. So it is really important. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting to I know. I guess that means having practice, uh, getting pra into practice again, and out of just the intellectual masturbation, <laughs> and figuring out what are the practices one would do in the moment of death. Yeah. Apparently, there's a way to work with it with dreamy, dream yoga, like sleep yoga. 
they uh, like a really advanced practice of of essentially being like very 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 concentrated as you're falling asleep and like fully mindful as you're falling asleep and there's a apparently you can access the bardo between the moment you fall asleep and the moment you like enter the dream state but i think it's like a very high level practice but i did read a book on dream yoga once and it talks about that and then you you're, and then you can essentially train yourself to get used to the bardo so that when you do die you can um, hopefully choose the right next life or, or mm. come in life. Yeah, you might have heard of it as lucid dreaming. Yeah, lucid dream, but it's like the highest form it, of lucid dream possible. And it's super hard. I tried to do it and I, I can't at all. But I'm fascinated by it because you are supposed to be able to have consciousness and watch your brain and how you're dreaming. And it yeah, is I, to be practice for what happens to you when you die. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing those perspectives. That was very useful. Good. Yeah, Vicky, I'll just add, I mean, a question that came up uh, in the original sharing of this course was sort of, why go through the logical proofs and the scriptural proofs like why can't we just get an enlightened being to tell us that this is the truth like why can't we just get someone to be like hey i've seen the ultimate nature of reality here are 40 of my friends who have two and here are all our testimonies you know here are people that have had near-death experiences they've gone beyond the threshold this is what they saw and and this is how it is right they're not doing that or that's not what we're being presented with um so the thing that I always put through my mind in terms of, is this a teaching that's getting me enlightened versus just getting me to have a slightly better samsara, right? Um, I ask myself, is it contributing to my two wings? So I, I don't know if you've heard of this, the, the two wings um, that carry you to waking up, to car that carry you to enlightenment. It's the wing of wisdom and the wing of compassion. You need both to get there. So basically the question I'd ask myself in learning anything about these beings, what does it open my heart at all? Does it help me have at least a little more compassion towards uh, an existence that I cannot see with my eyes? If it does, that's contributing to this wing of, of compassion um, or better translated bodhicitta, the wish to get enlightened, not just because I want to get out of the wheel of suffering, but because I realize my fate is intrinsically tied up in everyone else's. So is it doing that? But on the other hand, is it doing something to stoke my wisdom? So am I listening to all of this as, oh yeah, there's bardo beings out there and this is what they look like and this is what their life is like? Um, or am I challenging myself to see how it's totally possible that a bardo realm is possible if everything is a projection forced upon my own karmas upon an otherwise empty reality if it's doing any of those it's if it's the wind beneath either my wisdom wing or my compassion wing it's getting me there um, or if it's motivating me to i know you're saying it's not about a motivation thing but to you know david and thomas's points uh, lucid dreaming, it's considered a secret practice or what we talked about in terms of reaching nirvana from the bardo realm itself. How much am I fooling myself and saying I could do those deep meditations at that state where when I'm not even trying to do them now? Like there's no difference between right now and those times other than there's probably more fear and chaos. They say the the unique pain of feeling your body ripped away from your mind. Um, if you know any Tibetan, you know that like most Tibetan words have multiple words. You know, there's like seven words for mind, uh, but there's only one word for that unique type of pain that every being feels at the moment of death. And it, it would, I would be fooling myself to think I could do something with my mind at that time that could at all affect what's coming next. There's nothing I could do at that time. It's, it's predetermined in that it's already loaded in there. It's just putting slides in front of the projector at that time. 
So am I fooling myself and waiting for uh, those times to enact some practices or am I just doing everything I can right now? All the training I can. That's sort of, those are the things I put myself through when I'm confronted with anything, being like, is this Dharma? I, I appreciate that, especially the point of like, the thought of like having compassion for bardo beings is it's like alive and it's something that I had not even considered. Um, and uh, in fact, like one other thought I had during the lecture again, like in this like mentally sapped out state was about like that conception, how conception happens. It's almost seems like the a bardo being tries to, and pardon the language here, like join a couple of people having sex and instead find themselves becoming a baby and that that's thought how it's presented. yeah huh? sorry to interrupt but that's that is how it's presented yeah it's and that thought to me was like amusing in my head it's like ah oh, like silly bardo being uh <laughs> and now i'm realizing that if i truly had like deep compassion for the bardo being i perhaps would not have had that like mocking reaction <laughs> uh, so that is a powerful idea uh, thank you for sharing. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Thanks for your questions and your furrowed brows and big eyes. I tried to, if you could see my screen, it's like more than half all of you and then the slides really tiny because I already know the slides, but I'm here to see you all. These are just a few housekeeping items. Um, the one announcement that isn't on here, which because it's, it's freshly launched, but if any of you here are parents or no parents, Three Jewels Kids, um, we offer, we launched, any of you know Sarah Blackburn, she's really special and she spearheaded this. It's a virtual, completely virtual uh, kids camp for the summer. So like all the content's already been created. Ideally kids six through nine years old, but my sister's 24 and she's like, she really wants to do it. So it's really available for all ages, but it's uh, lessons for kids through the lens of Buddhism. It's not Buddhist, but it is about becoming uh, the best type of people that we can. So it's fun. If you've studied the six perfections, it'll be like that, but the kid version. Um, and Mackenzie can share more uh, or anyone else on here that's helped with that. But just check it out online or if you know anyone who has kids, send it their way. And the other announcement. I'll just add quickly. Um, it, it's also, I've been um, chatting with people who teach kids, like in elementary schools or if they teach their own like mindful version.